Welcome to the Spire Girls podcast, the self-publishing podcast for authors. You're in the right place for the best writing, marketing and publishing advice, plus interviews with industry experts and best-selling authors. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Shah Barrett. I'm Wendy Valor. And I'm Trudy J. Welcome. Welcome. And this week we have the amazing Kel Carpenter with us. Say hi, Kel. Hey, Kel. Hello. Hi, Kel. <laughs> hey. Um, so we're going to read out your bio and then we're going to dig into the topics of special editions for authors and also just um, a sprinkling of mindset to get us uh, out into the world in the right frame of mind. Um, but first, the bio. Cal Carpenter is a best-selling paranormal and fantasy romance author with over seven years experience in self-publishing and direct sales. Her dynamic career includes selling over half a million books across various platforms, engaging audiences in over five languages, and achieving well over six figures from her books. A shrewd entrepreneur, Cal combines her passion for the written word and a strategic mindset to innovate and lead in the direct-to-consumer market. She believes in sharing her insights and tactics with both aspiring and and existing authors eager to take charge of their publishing journey. Love that. Welcome. And Very cool. Mm -hmm. So, Cal, tell us a little bit about how you, you your journey into writing. Like, how did you get into self-publishing? And tell us a bit about you. So, I started when I was 20 years old. Um, I had already written a book, and I had been rejected by agents. I'm sure lots of people go through that where they first, you write a book, you want to see if you can publish it. You go to agents. Well, in my case, I was rejected by a lot of agents. And I was like, you know what? Screw them. I'm just going to see if it can work. So mm -hmm. I had seen other authors self-publishing. So I knew that it was an option. A little research and a few emails, finding an editor. And voila, there we have it. Then I started publishing. And it really just took off from the beginning, honestly. Wow. Um you know, my first month I made $50, but like my third month I made 3000. So oh, wow. it was a big, um, big change for me. Definitely. Like I expected it to do well, but I didn't expect it to do that well. And when I say expected it to do well for me, success was the only option. I was never going to accept failure. So if it didn't take off and that $50 was what I made month one, like I was going to find ways to get more than that every single month going beyond that. Yeah, oh, um, love that. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a yeah. great I love that mindset. attitude. And yeah. were you doing this um, full time, or were you? Did you have another job? Um, so I was also I was working at a pizza place at the time, and I was in college. So mm. doing lots wow. of things. Just, one just a couple of things, yeah, <laughs> going on. Yeah. And so, and then you went on. I think you said. I think I read somewhere that you went full time at twenty two. Is that? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so I went full time at 22. I could have gone much sooner, but I actually delayed because I wanted to feel more confident in that. Mm -hmm. I wanted income to be a bit more stable and knowing that I could go into it without having to panic if a month went down. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. 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 Very yeah. sensible. That's yeah. fantastic. Because <laughs> I, I don't know, when I was 20 slash 22, I'm not sure I would have been that confident. Like, I, I just think that's awesome. Yeah. I think you. Yeah. I is that you something back you yourself, right? Yeah. Have you always been like that? Or is that something you kind of just were like, no, this is going to work because it's my dream or. I've always been like that with things. Yeah. yeah. I, I tend to get tunnel vision when I decide I'm going to do something yeah. and I will find a way it's going to work come hell or high water. Yeah. Wow. That's good. Awesome. That's very really good. Yeah. Find oh. a few of us had that, eh? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so um and then so you've been publishing ever since and it's um so how many books have you got what's the tell us a bit about the genre and, and where you've been going since so then? i've got 31 number 32 actually releases next week so that's wow. exciting okay. congratulations yes congratulations yeah so it's 30 before 30 is what i like to say <laughs> nice yeah i've got out um I would say that I'm fairly prolific, but at the same time, when I compare it to some authors that can get out, you know, monthly and whatnot, I'm definitely not there. So I'm I'm somewhere in the middle as far as what we consider um, prolific, I guess. Authors. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. And and what's the genre? Is it? It hasn't all been oh, fantasy yeah, romance. Yeah, paranormal and fantasy romance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they started out as parrot. Because because fantasy romance, were you always writing that, or have you moved with um, given the popularity of it these days? Um, no, I've always kind of written that. I wrote a fantasy romance series a few years back, but I haven't done a whole lot with it since then. So I'm 
sort of coming back more to my roots a little bit now that mm -hmm. it's very popular and I've got mm. some serious ideas that fall within the current expectations of the market. Yeah, mm. yeah, fantastic. That's, that's cool. very cool to have those books there ready to, yeah. to jump on that bandwagon. I think that's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. awesome. So you've also got Rule Your Author Empire, which is your kind of your teaching arm. You've got the book, which which I love the premise of the book. So how did so it's like basically you've you're someone who's four to five um figures and you wanted to get to six figures. It's that kind of author, that's the author that you're aiming at. Where did that come from? How did you decide that you wanted to start teaching other authors? So Sky Warren actually wrote a book, um, best selling author next door, and I really loved her book. Like it was very instrumental in how I viewed some things and it just played a big big impact for me. And I wanted to kind of spread that where I wanted to get back to the community. Um, and I thought about like, who are the people that I think I could actually help the most? I'm not a seven figure author, but I know how to get to six figures pretty well. And I know a, a variety of ways to do it. And so I was like, I think I could help authors that are trying to become full-time authors, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, those are the people, if you're already making four or five figures, I think it's not that much of a leap to get to six figures. You know, I say that with the caveat because I know some people are like, it's harder than it sounds, but I do think there are ways and where there's a will, there's a way. That is very much my belief of things. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. And then, so everyone go out and buy the book and you can read what <laughs> else is there. So then you've also got um, a couple of courses and the one that we really want to talk about is, is you've had some success with special editions. So can you tell us, so ha how you got into special editions and, and how, um, yeah, just start off with that. How did you get in there? And when have you? So I started doing them on Kickstarter first and that was a year, two years probably two years ago now at this point, time kind of blends together for me. I've got a small child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I started doing them then. I was really interested in the concept. They were kind of new on the market at the time. Like you weren't really seeing a lot of people doing them yet, but I love pretty things and I'm a book collector. So I was like, yeah, I want to do that. Like that sounds right up my alley. Yeah. So I dived in, I fell flat on my face the first time. Like my first campaign didn't raise that much money. It raised just enough to cover the cost of the books. And like, it didn't cover our time at all because I ran it with my co-author. So yeah. mm. <laughs> that one was not the best, but I learned a lot from it yeah. and I continued to do better each time. So the first one, I want to say we made like $12,000. Um, the second one we, I made 23,000 and then 40,000. And now my current one that I'm on is at 51,000, I believe. Um, so that's just kind of the trajectory that my Kickstarters have done. I also yeah. started selling them direct from my store because I love being direct. I love being able to cut out the middleman and mm -hmm. Kickstarter actually limits you from being able to run multiple kickstarters in between so like if you run one you have to completely fulfill it before you can run another one uh, and i was like well i want to jump more on the bandwagon before this runs out like you know much like everything in publishing there's going to be a hot phase and uh, i want to be here for it so i was like okay i'm going to find a way to sell from my store then if that's the case because if i can do it on kickstarter why can't i do it on my store yeah well mm -hmm. that i can do it on my store and I can do it quite well with my store. And so that's kind of, my business has pivoted to a lot of special editions. Now I've got orders coming in all the time. I've got orders going out, um, things in works with all of my different printers at different stages. So it's really keeps me on my toes. Can you tell us the process? Like, um, so you've got a book obviously, and it's, it's on Amazon or whatever, and it's in print, and then you're going to turn it into a special, a special edition, right? So what's the first step towards that? I mean, is it, you know, obviously you've got a format and then you've got to get a graphic design done for the cover? I would say the first step is you need to decide what you want to do for your special edition. So right. you need to decide if you're going to do a new cover. If so, obviously book that cover designer. You need to decide if you're going to have edges of some sort done. Yeah. Um, and if you're going to have that with the cover designer or if you're going to have another artist do that, are you going to have in papers? Are you going to have blackout pages or any fancy formatting? So yeah. all of those things, I guess, are your step one of figuring out what you want to do for your special edition. Because until you know what you want to do for it, you yeah. can't really move forward with any other aspects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you, as a as an author looking around, how do you kind of research that? Would it just yeah. be to go to other Who authors? Who do you go to? Yeah. 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 How do you know um, it's possible? In my case, like I, well, yeah, I look around for when I 
figure out what's possible. Um, if I see it done once, I know that someone can do it. So I find yeah. that someone and I go to get it done. Yeah. Um, you know, it's much like anything else, I guess, when it comes to that. The printers and the people that do this, they offer a lot of the same options as each other. Um, particularly once you get to start working with overseas printers, a lot of them offer, you know, everything you can think of. Um, mm. And so it's just looking around and then deciding, okay, I want to do this. How do I do this? Yeah. And so you and just send the printer it. all the files and everything and they just get it all going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Can That's I? Cool. Can I just jump back a step? So were you already doing direct sales before you started doing your special editions? Or did you set it up? Yeah. Okay. So how, how long have you been doing direct sales just out of curiosity? So I've been doing direct sales for a little over a year now. Okay. Yeah. So I guess technically I was doing special editions sooner because I've done Kickstarters, but I wasn't selling them from my store until this year. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing ebook sales primarily um, okay. when I started out with direct sales. Yeah, perfect. And, and you're selling you through to... Shop. You're selling through Shopify, right? Yes. Yeah. So and so, who does your? Is it like Book Vault or someone like that does them? Or nope. I have an in-home PA now that does the packaging and all of the sending oh, right. for those. Yeah. Um, we reached a point. I was doing it myself for the longest time. So I reached a point in, in August when I had a Kickstarter order that I had to fulfill. There was about three hundred boxes on top of my regular orders. And I was so overwhelmed that I was finally like, screw it. I need an in-person PA. Mm -hmm. So I actually went through the process and I found a really lovely person and she handles all of that now so that I don't have to do any of it. Yeah. So the books come to you and then they're posted out. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Or do they go straight to her? Like, is she working when you say in-house, is she working like literally in-house or at her point of business? Uh, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. no. So I have a room in my house set up as a shipping facility. And then I also have a storage unit where all of the overflow goes. And she goes mm -hmm. between the storage unit and here to handle getting everything ready. And then once she's got a package there, I just schedule for pickup with pirate ship. Mm -hmm. um, and then they come the next day and they pick up everything. Well, that must have been such a relief getting that off your yeah. plate. <laughs> so much. Made me so many hours in the day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. And you being in yeah. the States, you're in the States, aren't you? Obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we here it's a little bit different. We'd have to yeah. sort of pay massive postage from New Zealand to go anywhere. But yeah. I guess if someone wants to, to to buy them, they'll pay the postage. You can also look at using a fulfillment facility in the States mm -hmm. as yeah. a potential, and they're not super expensive. I've done looking at them, and you can get them as low as $2 a box. Okay. So that's pretty reasonable for what it is and yeah. you got to pay for the storage for when they get your books in but if they're sending them out as soon as they get them in they're not going to have them very long so it's not going to be a huge dip into your profits mm -hmm. right well, that's a good idea okay. too yeah mm -hmm. see so many yeah. things so many things to think so about. many things because yeah. it's interesting this whole the whole special edition thing it kind of you know with ebooks we just put the book up and then kind of amazon mm -hmm. takes care of it or whoever all the other platforms but the doing special editions it puts us back into kind of almost this position of being a distributor is there because mm -hmm. is there any other way that people do special editions like um, that doesn't involve it coming to your house and you posting them out to people or is that that's the best way to do it in your opinion I wouldn't say it's the best way. It's the way that I do it because mm -hmm. I started off and I wanted to, I started with what was doable for me by myself before mm -hmm. I had someone else with me. So what was doable for me was to have them come to my house, me pack them up and send them out. Mm -hmm. um, and then as time's gone on and I've got more orders, now I have someone. Mm -hmm. But I do think a fulfillment place is a really good option. That is mm -hmm. something that I've talked about with a number of authors because there's a lot that aren't in the mm -hmm. States for one. So some of the people in my classes um, are not. And that was a big conversation was like, what does that look like then for us? Yeah, yeah. You know, because it's not as simple as it just coming to our house. And a lot of readers are not willing to pay, you know, 40, 50, 60 dollars or whatever for yeah. shipping. Mm -hmm. um and so the fulfillment facility is a really good option there's also places that are popping up within the indie community um small businesses that are offering fulfillment for authors for things like that mm -hmm. i also have a trusted friend that actually ended up sending out some of my orders um that's in the community she's another author and 
I help her with ads and she helps me by sending out some things yeah. with yeah. overflow. So it worked oh, out that's well. That's great. Yeah. 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 So if anyone, if you knew someone in the States who could mm. do that on your behalf, that would kind of work mm. out too. Yeah. Mm. It's I also like anything, isn't it? Hired a, um, she hired a PA in the States and her PA gets the books in at her house and does the shipping out. So that's another option too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, There's always workarounds, absolutely. isn't there? Yeah, you know, mm. you've just got to actually instead of panicking, which is my first mm. reaction, mm. <laughs> you've got to just think about it. What what's going to work for you, and that fulfillment facility might be something to look into, definitely. Yeah. In terms of designs for your special editions, Cal, have you sort of mixed them up in terms of like the sprayed edges or the foiling? Have you are you playing with that as well as a as a book lover? Uh, yeah, so I've tried doing them without edges versus with edges. I will say I will always do edges in the future because oh. it makes a huge difference on whether it sells or not Yeah, okay. when it comes to readers. Um, a special edition without edges is a lot less likely to sell. So even if it's a forced edge versus a digital edge, mm. um, I would still do it all the time. When it comes to the cover itself, it kind of depends on your goal. So I distinguish from a special edition something called a deluxe edition where you use your original cover and maybe you have it foiled wow. um, and then you have an edge done with it. Well, that's like a deluxe edition and I'm seeing this used by publishers online too. So that's kind of mm -hmm. where I'm distinguishing a little bit is the terminology I'm seeing on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really good for branding, which is like the primary reason that if you're wanting to do that. So like for a new release, I actually think deluxe editions are a really great idea. Instead of going with a brand new cover, using your existing cover, mm. you know, having foiling done and then having an edge design done. I think that's a perfectly yeah. appealing cover, um, appealing product to readers mm. versus having a brand new cover done with mm. everything and all the bells and whistles. Um, that's a true special edition yeah. comparatively. Especially and if you're going to go, have to go to another designer I mean, that's, that's time and it's money and yes. you don't know how it's going to work. But if you if your books are selling well with the current cover, then doing those things may, might be a safer option. Yeah, it could be a safer mm. option. Mm. It also depends, I guess. In my case, I have several very trusted designers right. where I don't worry when I go to them if I'm going to end up with something off brand. I know mm. my brand. They know my brand. Like I've had designers that I've had them completely mix concepts and restart over and they do it and they do it beautifully. So like, I know who I can go to for that, but I know that not everyone has that. How, how do you find your designers? I don't want the names. And not, I wouldn't ask that of you, but where do you actually go? You like um, you know, I use the cover design review group a decent bit, and I look at designers there. I also just go based on recommendation. I look mm -hmm. around and I see, I'm in so many design groups. So when I see someone that pops up and it seems like they're suddenly doing something that I'm interested in, I'm like, oh, I need to follow you. And so I go follow them and I get on their schedule and then I see how they work. And if they work the way I like to work, then we're kosher and like, we're good to go from there. But mm -hmm. if not, yeah, you know, I'm like, okay, I'll just write it off and yeah. keep on my way and find someone else to do it. Yeah. So you've really got to do your groundwork, don't you? You've got to take the time to, to work mm -hmm. out. Mm. yeah it doesn't feel like it but you are correct like mm. I don't think yeah. of it that way because I'm like oh I'm online and I'm responding to reader things anyways so just like seeing cover stuff doesn't really yeah. you know matter mm. but it is it is all groundwork and mm. that's yeah. important to remember when doing it mm. yeah okay yeah. it obviously comes yeah. naturally to you but for anyone who doesn't think yeah. like that normally this is just something they're going to have to think about and do yeah. um mm -hmm. can I just clarify something with the special editions and, and deluxe are they always um because you see the hardback versus the paperback. Is that something that you've tested out? Is there a difference between them? How does that work? I have tested that, and I do find that hardback sells better because you'll yeah. get people, a lot of readers, that are like, I want the hardback. Even if you tell them there's never going to be a hardback special edition, they're still going to wait for the hardback. Yeah. So mm. just do the hardback from the beginning is my recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Because I've got, um, I've seen, I was in the, when I was in the States um, just recently, I saw in, I think it was just like Walmart, it was a paperback version of a book and it just had the edges and the stuff. I bought it because it was exciting to me because it had the 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 yeah. edges sprayed, but it was just a paperback and I was interested mm -hmm. by that. Like that was literally all they'd done differently. I definitely think that there's a room for them in the special edition sphere, but I think that it's a more mainstream thing that like, if you have a publisher and your books are in bookstars, you stand out more if you have edges versus whether you're a hardback or paperback. Um, 
So I think like that's where those people can really benefit. Also selling on Amazon because Amazon doesn't currently have a lot of special editions. It's really easy to stand out among the special editions that are on there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm constantly scouring Amazon, waiting for new things to pop up and seeing who's doing what, what publisher is doing what um, to kind of keep my thumb on the pulse, so to speak. Yeah. So when you put up these special editions, you've talked about it being on your website, but actually, can you put can you put them up on um, the other retailers that do sell print? Like, can you put it up? Would you put it up as like a hardcover version of the book, or is that not how it works? Typically, I mean, I would say you could with Amazon. I don't know about the other resellers. So that's I know Amazon. You've... If you create a special account, um, a vendor account, then you can actually put up your special editions and sell them that way. The reason I don't do it is because they take like forty percent of the profits. Mm. Right. Yeah, and I'm not interested in, in giving Amazon more money. I'm interested mm. in getting away from Amazon, so yeah. mm. that's why I sell direct and I use Kickstarter and do that. Yeah. Fair enough. So you don't okay. load your hardbacks onto um, Amazon? Or you, mm -hmm. or you, no. Not my special okay. edition. No. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. No, that's cool. I think that's awesome. And so, have you noticed an uptick in other sales of like eBooks or just the regular print books because of the special editions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely seen, I sell through with eBooks and regular books um, pretty well because I only run ads to my special editions at this point. I'm not even running ads to my, my general eBooks for the most part. I think I might have one actually that's like $10 or something like that. But like, mm -hmm. so vast majority of them are for special editions and I definitely see my other books selling um, in the store. So yeah, it's nice. Do you have any recommendations for anything for the for the ads themselves? Like, are you are you kind of doing a video ad holding up the book itself, or is it a, just a so it depends. Um, usually, when you're starting out, you don't have the book itself in hand because that's mm -hmm. farther on the steps down with the printer and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I create a three D image, and I use Procreate to do it, but your designer can also do it to put the edge on the book because it's really important to readers. Like they're very visual, so you need to show them exactly what they're getting. Yeah. So you want the book with the edge. I put that up and I say, hey, special edition announcement. I've got this book coming. This is a pre-order. It's going to be delivered in this time frame. And I usually give like a three month time frame so that I'm not locked into a singular month. And I tell them, you know, it's a special pre-order only price. You can only get it in my store so they don't go look for it elsewhere and then get distracted and then never buy because confusion and all of that is how you lose buyers. Yeah. And I tell them what upgrades it comes with. And that is what I usually put up and what I run my ads on. And it does very well. Um, when I do have the books to actually do video ads, I will start doing videos that show not even my face, but just me flipping through, showing off the book, the end papers, um, the edges, and those do pretty well as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you get the majority of your sales in those pre-order period or are they are that still really good? Yeah. No, it's the pre-order. What sort of price do you put on your um, special editions? So for a singular book, I would charge somewhere between $30 and $40. For an omnibus, I charge $75, $85, depending on. Yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah, cool. That's cool. They're um, very cool. I when I went to I went to Rare Edinburgh this year and the special editions there were mind blowing. They were so beautiful. Mm, they yeah. really look good. Yeah. So is there anything else that you can think of around special editions that is kind of helpful to someone just starting out? Like if they're just thinking about it, what would they, you know, something that you kind of got tripped up by or just something that will help them out? If you're just starting out, don't overdo it. That's really going to, it's going to come back to bite you um, because for each type of thing that you have done with a special edition, it's a different kind of file. And so getting all of those different files together and getting everything and having absolutely no errors, um, it can be a lot your first time around. So I would recommend doing a new cover and a forced edge and printing it with Ingram. That's actually like what I would, would recommend for someone starting out wanting to just dip their toe in and see like, okay, is this even like something I can do? Um, my first one that was, yeah, that was actually my first one was a special cover. It's not foiled or anything. And an edge that I had formatted so that it's a forced edge. I don't know if everyone is familiar with the different terminology no, for can edges. Can you explain that? No. Yeah. I, I was going to say it occurred to me. <laughs> That's something people <laughs> have tripped up on. So a forced edge has a tiny barcode that is embedded in the side of each page. 
And when you close the book, it looks like an image on, on the side. Oh, of course. Yeah. Mm, okay. So that's how you can get it done with Ingram or anywhere else because it's embedded in the file itself mm. and it's a black and white thing. Yeah. You can get them done in color, but then you have to have your whole book done in color. So I don't recommend that. Mm. Um, a digital edge is where the printer literally prints on the side of the book. Um. And that's what creates it. And that's usually if they're super crisp and pretty and designed and like fine details, they're typically that. And then spray edge is someone went in and hand sprayed that. Mm, okay do they okay. do that like the the sprayed edge is that uh, make it more expensive to be hand done or it, yes so the sprayed edge is the most expensive option it's the option i like the least out of them for that reason yeah. you're going to pay 750 or more per book to have it sprayed and that's for like a flat color that's not even something special going on with it so yeah. i really don't recommend that one out of all the options unless you're yeah. planning to do it yourself I can tell you it's harder than it looks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to test it out at one point because I was like, oh, I have a spray gun. I can do yeah, this. Yeah. yeah, this will be fine. No, never again. Never touching that. <laughs> so, was it Anne, Anne Marie Meyer's husband that does hers? No. In the, uh, in the garage? Willow, like, Willow Winters. I oh, think Willow. They do oh yeah, Willow Winters. Yeah, her husband <laughs> yeah. does hers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, if you want to see picture. that, go to Willow Winters uh, TikTok um, yeah. or Facebook and you can see yeah. the videos there. Yeah. So, yeah. So the TikTok is an interesting point. Like, do you use TikTok to, um, do you have a TikTok account? Is that something that you're doing as well? Or is this? So I have a TikTok account. I have a love-hate relationship with TikTok, though. I do not have a TikTok shop. I closed it um, okay. because I don't like the turnaround time of two days. I think that's unreasonable. <laughs> and yeah. I can't promise that with how much books I'm moving at this point in time. Like, I don't have my PA come in every day. I have her come in a couple times a week. Yeah. So right. promising that it's going to be put out within 48 hours is just not doable. Yeah. Um, I do repost videos that I'm going to be posting on Instagram onto TikTok, but that's about the extent of what I do there. Most of my focus is actually Instagram and Facebook ads. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. And Can so I what ask... do you do on Instagram? Are you there more often? Is that your, is that your platform? I am there more often because I doom scroll on Instagram fairly yeah. frequently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. Instagram algorithm knows me. It knows what I want to see. Like it's oh. very good at roping me in and keeping me. Yeah. So. yeah. Damn, those um, what with formatting the files and all of that do you how do you do that do you do all the formatting or who does that for you for yeah i just use vellum um vellum. same as i would for a regular book i don't typically do fancy formatting in my special editions um i'm looking at doing blackout pages but i haven't done them yet and i need to find a formatter to do them so odds are i'm not going to do them this time around because that just seems like extra work and i don't feel like doing it this time what's yeah. a blackout page is it a page of an image so it's a page that is black and it has white text mm. and they do that for the entire book not just like chapter pages yeah. like so the whole book yeah. is done black with white text yeah wow yeah. okay that's a whole I have thing. some and they're very pretty and I like them um they're part of my hoard that's behind me yeah but yeah you're now making mm. me want to go and buy some of these special editions. Yeah, to yeah. To see what I was God, just going to say that. Too. I actually <laughs> think that's important. If you're going to get into it, I think you actually do need to hold them mm. and have them in your hands mm. to actually yeah. see what's available. Trouble is, yeah. I should have been hoarding them whilst I was in the US and not from the <laughs> 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 Okay, so you do them in Vellum and then you just put that in the file and send that to the printer and then that's how it all happens. Okay. Can I ask something? I don't understand about the forced edge thing, the barcode. Is that in, is that done in vellum or is that something that's done? By so the I have printer? to go to a special person that does it. And let's see. Yeah, you can see it here. Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally a yep. barcode on the side of the page. Uh, okay. so if people are listening to us, they can't see it, but it that's uh, what it looks like. So that yeah. when you close it, you can see the image. Uh, okay. it a little, wow, nice. But, that's cool. Is that what you prefer? Um, I wouldn't say I prefer it. I actually prefer the painted edge because they're just much more obvious. Yeah. Oh, that is so pretty. Um, oh, pretty. my gosh. Yeah. I've got that. one. If we're going to show things, this is um, Helena Hunting. This is the book that I bought at Walmart. It's literally just a, a paperback, but it's got this awesome picture. Oh, yeah. yeah, so that's definitely a printed edge, um, a um, digital edge specifically. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay. so the so the mm -hmm. barcode I one that we're doing down the side is that so that's not something that's done in vellum then that's something done in so you take your vellum file, the PDF, and you send it to someone 
who then puts the barcode in it and they will send it back to you and then you upload it. Okay. Uh, so someone would be a designer or? Um, you have to go to a special formatter. So like Painted Wings does it. I use a chick named Karen who does it um, that I found in the 20 books group. Okay. I find all kinds of random people just through <laughs> Like I tell a someone named Karen, for, it's very Karen. Off with little birds that find them in groups for me, and they're like, "Oh, so and so recommended so and so in this group," and I'm like, "Yes, let's get on it." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Finding people that are recommended. Search you know? Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were very, if you if you were very first starting out, what age would you go with? Um, I'm asking for someone. Starting. Sorry, asking for yeah. a friend. I would go with the forced edge starting out because you can print it with Ingram and. Yeah makes it simpler i mean you yeah. can even do it as like a signing exclusive versus yeah. having it be something that you're selling in your store yeah. just as a to test the waters and kind of get a yeah. feel for it mm -hmm. um because if you're ordering from a printer like particularly an overseas printer you have to order 200 minimum uh, so right. that's a barrier to entry for a lot of people which mm -hmm. is why i do pre-orders because i want to make sure i'm going to sell those books before i buy them mm -hmm. And so that's why the majority of mine, like, I don't even have any left over by the time they come in from the printer. Usually, yeah. if anything, I'm having to order extras and be like, yo, can you ship these really fast? Like, mm, yeah. I need yeah. Yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So what's the difference between, so what does Ingram offer to someone who's just starting out versus one of the other printers? Is, is it just the, the, that you can order fewer than 200 or? I would say that's the big thing with Ingram. Mm -hmm. Um you have higher numbers of damages, which I don't like, and Ingram it doesn't have to replace them. They can choose to, and they can choose to not to. Mm -hmm. So you really, it's the luck of the draw with who you get when you send in a, a complaint. Um, but they are print on demand and you can get them quickly. So you can have your books in hand in less than a month and mm -hmm. you can order however many you want. So if you wanted to order 200, you could, but you could also order 20 and see how it goes. And I think that there's something about that that's, really beginner friendly yeah mm -hmm. yeah i like that idea yeah but you're still getting them delivered to your house and you're still manually sending them out ingram doesn't do any of that so if you wanted to use your same cover that you got up on your ebook or your, how would you go about would you just go to a graphic designer and say hey i want to turn this into a special edition can you make it whatever how would you make it special? Do you just go to a designer with the file? Or? So I would go to the designer that did the cover and ask them if I could do foiled text. So they're going to have to create another layer within, actually technically two layers. They'll have to separate the background from the text and have two different files for that. And then I would go to one of my people that does edges and I would be like, hey, I want to do a digital edge. Can you design me something? So for that, it's just the typical illustrators or yeah designer that can do the edge i mean you could ask the person that did the cover or you can um go to someone separate either one works really mm. and those are the two things like i would definitely do if i'm wanting to do mm -hmm. are digital like edges normally just black and white or can they be color uh digital edges i mean forced edges like, forced edges sorry forced edges can be colored but you're going to pay for cool, full color interiors yeah words so it's going to be a lot more expensive yeah yeah have you and you said you because i in vellum now i feel like you can add lots of pictures and stuff am i making that up you can so You're not so if someone that up. oh good i'm glad i'm not <laughs> <laughs> haven't done yeah. it so i'm not sure um and so you could do that on the inside for them and, and make it look pretty as well if you wanted to via vellum that would be pretty yeah. easy yeah okay well, so many options so much pretty stuff I'm just um, looking at it and going, well, I just shut that note up and not ever look at it again because it confuses me. But no, <laughs> I, need to, <laughs> I need to do it. Yeah, I need yeah, to do yeah. it. Okay. So cool. we feel better about special editions now, team? Can I move on Absolutely. to the next topic? Yes, move yeah. on, move on. Move on. So I think, can I just say that I just want to reiterate how much effort and time and energy Cal's put into researching this. So there's no... Yes. You know, do you yeah. got to do the work? You yeah. have to do the work, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. and look at yeah. for those personal recommendations. And I I like your idea of starting off small, just to mm. yeah. And also, if you do need extra help, obviously you've got the course. It's, Absolutely, um, I thought relatively. You do office hours in the course too, so that people yeah. can get personalized recommendations based on what they themselves are wanting to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So, cool. Yeah. Thing. So it's one hundred and forty nine dollars. I thought that that wasn't um, that was a really good yeah, price awesome. for getting extra Might help and, and yeah. getting the the you know the the process kind of um, 
you know sorted mm. in your head because it is kind of something that is a little bit it feels like it's got a few moving pieces um mm. and it might be a good idea to get you know get someone right who knows the what start. they're doing mm. to tell you what to do yeah anyway mm, yeah so so and because the other thing that we that you've talked about in in groups and various groups and stuff is that you had to you've been working on mindset you've you've been coached with heather hildenbrand who we'd had on the show i think she's mm. awesome um and I wanted to talk through a bit about that mindset shift that you've had and how that's all worked. Um, well, we've got a I still got a bit of time on the interview, so um, so can you talk to us a little bit about your mindset journey? Like, what's happened? What's changed for you over time that that that's helped you kind of get to your success level now? So Heather is really good at helping with money blocks for one, and she helps you find blocks that you didn't even know you had. You know, you'll just be talking about something, and she'll be like that's a block. We should talk about that, you know? <laughs> um, so I probably started almost a year ago with Heather and we have dealt with so much, honestly. Um, the biggest thing that I think when you consider like what she does is looking at money, the question becomes how much more will I allow? That's like one of her main phrases that she uses how much more will you allow to come into your life? Will you allow yourself to make? Once mm -hmm. you open the doors and say, I don't have to just make money on Amazon. I can make money anywhere. I don't care where it comes from. The universe finds ways to send you that money, whether it's special editions, which is in my case, something that happens, or, you know, I have a German publisher and I make really good money on my audiobooks in German. So that's like a thing right there. And there's just lots of ways. Um, I think that that's a lot like the core teaching there, I guess, when it comes to at least mindset with money specifically, that's a lot of what it comes down to with Heather. And it sounds really simplified when I say it this way, but it's not as simple when people have blocks and they don't believe either that they deserve it or that they can somehow achieve it, um, that they're not worthy. Uh, those are some of the really common things that you tend to see when it comes to mindset that she's really helped me work through. Mm. yeah yeah that's cool and so we're all just nodding rapidly because yes, we all yeah, have nodding. those things going we on love our, we love heather yeah. Yeah. what led you to her initially cal just out of curiosity was it a recommendation i was already friends with heather and i knew she did mindset stuff and i decided to read her book um because i was like yeah. yo what's this about like and at first it was a little woo-woo for me and she knows i said this so i don't mind saying it on live yeah. <laughs> yeah. um but as I got into it, I was like, wow, this is like really like she gets into some deep stuff. OK, like I can I can be here for this. Let's do it. You know, and so mm -hmm. I kept going and I kept reading and I started implementing the things that she talks about in the book. And I found that I felt help, happier and more positive. And I liked the person I was becoming just implementing mm -hmm. those things. So I went to her and I was like, can I get in with you? Um I would love to like do coaching and whatnot. And so, you know, I waited my turn. And then when it came up for coaching time, I was like, yes, let's do it. I am ready to go like yesterday. Mm -hmm. And she helped me uncover so many things beyond what I myself had found um, just by reading her book. So mm -hmm. I think that her book is a really great place to start for anyone that's interested in general mindset, um, whether you're interested in it with her or someone else. I think that it's a really author focused place to be um yeah. and there's a lot to take away from it for sure yeah because yeah. you think a lot of authors were in our head right a lot mm -hmm. we're the kind of people that you kind of you're imagining things happening all day long mm -hmm. it's it, it helps to get kind of get out of that or or get someone Some kind of clarity. looking at that with yeah. you yeah definitely so mm -hmm. um can you I don't know if you mind talking about this but just you you were kind of talking about earlier in the year that maybe you were um having a few doubts or a few issues and then you kind of just went no I'm gonna you know I'm gonna keep going move through it and you kind of pivoted and then it all kind of came flowing for you which I kind of think you put down to maybe just keep going and keep pivoting and keep working through and and things will eventually happen does that so, sound right <laughs> yes um in the beginning of the year, I was really struggling. I didn't like that I was so reliant on Amazon. I know I talk about that a lot, but having to wait 60 days for your money to come in is just crazy to me when you think about it. 
And I didn't like that they could just suddenly take it away at any point in time. Um, that makes me like very uncomfortable. And in terms of safety, that's like zero safety. Mm-hmm. And I'd already seen that my ebook sales showed that I could do this on my own. So I was like, okay, that's a, that's a way to pivot. But my ebook sales weren't making like crazy money. Um, so I was making consistent money, like enough to get by and like do my thing and, you know, pay for my house and all that. But I, I wasn't making the kind of money that I wanted to be making. Um, and I was struggling to figure out what's the next thing to do, because that's really the question like you got to ask yourself is what is the next avenue? Is it special editions or translations or audiobooks or, 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 um, and so for me, I looked at special editions and I was like, okay, let's, let's do this. Like, that seems like a good avenue. I enjoy them and I know how to do them. So I'm like, okay just do more of them. That seems like a good idea, you know, and Heather very much is like, you got to play more, not just work more, Cal. Like you can't just hustle, hustle, hustle. Cause eventually you burn out. And that's very true. I, this year I've been struggling with a lot of burnout and I actually have written very little less than I've written any other year in my author career. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote a book at the beginning of the year um, in January and February with my co-author and then we released it in March and I hadn't actually written until this last month. So Mm -hmm. a very long stint of me not really like having the words. Um, I find that after I finish a book now, it usually takes me at least several weeks to a couple months to actually get to a place that I feel like writing again. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of that just being the process that we've had for the last couple of years of being up on deadlines. um, I don't like that. It makes me very uncomfortable. (laughs) But my co-author thrives on deadlines. Mm. So we, we've we done that for a bit and we're moving away from that now, thankfully. Um, but the lack of words also made me worried that like what happens if the income dries up? Like if I have no more words, how am I going to make more money? Mm. You know, like we're so reliant on new releases as indie authors that mm. you don't think about like, okay, selling the same product more ways. And so that was when I was like, okay, well, if the words dry up, that sucks, but I've got 30 products what are other ways I can sell those 30 products to my readers again Mm -hmm. and find more readers. Mm -hmm. And that's when I buckle down with ads and now with special editions. And honestly, in two years, it's probably going to be something different. Mm -hmm. There's probably going to be something new because that's how the the industry goes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that you may not have been writing in those months, but it sounds as though you were doing a heck of a lot of other stuff as well. So, Mm -hmm. and, and learning, that takes time too. So it's it can't be undervalued when the end product is what you've achieved, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a lot of time spent in admin. Um, mm-hmm. I worked on like the Rule Your Author Empire book for a couple months there. So mm-hmm. I guess technically I was writing. Different kind of writing though. It, yeah. it felt like when I would go in if I were to do a really long Facebook post about different mm-hmm. topics. Like that's yeah. what it felt like when I was writing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I had a book coach, uh, Lisa Daly, who helped me with it, who was between her and Heather, I feel like they really got me through several months there where I was just struggling to figure out what next. And then I went to a retreat of Heather's in May and my idea for special editions, like to kick them off the way that I decided to on my website happened in June. Um, And I feel like that kind of was like a moment for me there. I feel like Mm -hmm. that kind of led to that. Mm. And has that yeah. has that come, you know, with with your store? Has that come at the expense of doing more um, Kickstarters? Is that instead do of doing those? So you were doing some Kickstarters, and then you started promoting through your store as well because you saw that there was an avenue there. So do you, will you still do Kickstarter, or will you just promote through your store now? I will continue to do both because Kickstarter okay. brings its own audience to the table as well. 40 to 50% of the people that buy my Kickstarters are new to me readers. Oh, wow. So I like getting that new audience and that audience that is willing to pay. Cause that's an important part is the more readers that you have that are actually willing to pay serious money for your books. You don't have to have as many of them then. Mm-hmm. So I definitely mm-hmm. value my Kickstarter audience and I will continue to do Kickstarters as I'm able to, I'll probably do like two a year. Um, And then I'm going to have my process right now is that I'm putting up my omnibuses in my store first because I can Mm -hmm. sell those very easily in my store. And when I'm doing individual books for series, I'll do those through Kickstarter. So that's kind of like the the process that I've come up with over the last year. 
So what does an omnibus consist of? How many books are we talking here? So my omnibuses have three to four books in them. It depends. Um, if it's got like four, it's usually because the books are shorter. Okay. Otherwise, I don't like to have it over 850 pages. So okay. at that point, you start to see issues with the binding splitting. Yeah. Right. Um, and while not a lot of readers read them, some do. And I want them to be a quality product. So I don't like to go 800 above 850 pages. Um, you also start having to use like Bible paper, super thin and right. easily, easily yeah. damaged. I don't like that. Well, thanks for sharing that because I think that's very important, actually. Mm -hmm. And I also, don't want people to have a good experience. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. we've all had those big books that it's nothing mm. more annoying than when something falls out. But I also think that's just what you just glanced on then was the fact that people don't necessarily read these books. They're, they're often a work of art, really, aren't they, on their shelf. They've probably got, got it in ebook form or, you know, normal paperback if you like to read and then these special editions are kind of art mm -hmm. when I saw my special editions I always offer an upsell that gives them ebooks or audiobooks or both yeah because that is for those readers that are brand new to me that are buying and there's a lot of them because the the readership for special editions are collectors at the mm. core yeah it's they're not just readers they're people that want these for shelf mm. trophies mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're yeah. going to see a lot of brand new people. I find in running ads that cold audiences actually do very, very well for special editions. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people assume that it's just their mega fans, but it's really not. I'd say the majority of it is brand new to you people. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Are you advertising to people who have an interest in, in um, fantasy <laughs> romance, for example, or are you advertising to people who are interested in special editions? Is there a difference there? Um, yeah, so it's just, the way that you do the audiences with Facebook, you know, you can do it for genre, you can do it for author names, you can do it for Kickstarter or anything else. So I test out different audiences to see what does well. And then I can compare that way. Um, I also because I have a Facebook pixel, um, that makes it easier. You know, the direct sales ads are just yeah. much, much, much easier with pixels. Yeah. See who's mm. coming, who's who's yeah. converting mm. on the on the website. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I just want to move back onto the uh, we've moved back to special editions, and I'm going to push us back into mindset. <laughs> about a few more questions. Um, so you said somewhere that the hustle culture is toxic. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Like, have you? Did you? I feel like maybe you used to have more of a hustle cu culture feeling to what you did, and now you don't. So can you? Yeah. So my, my old phrase that I used to live and die by was ignore the haters, be a hustler. Okay. So this is what my phrase was going into things with Heather where Heather was like, let's start there. <laughs> <laughs> block number one. <laughs> yes, block number one. Like, why is that the case? I grew up in a family that believed that you had to work hard to achieve anything. And so I grew up with a very strong work, work ethic and belief that the harder I worked, the more I could make. Um, so that was like big block that Heather and I had to deal with when it came to my personal blocks is mm -hmm. that I felt like if I just worked harder, well, what happens when I'm working 90 hours a week and I now have a child and I've got to run a house and I've got to exist still as a person. Like, what does that look like? Well, it looks like burnout mm -hmm. and exhaustion and someone mm -hmm. that no one really wants to be around. Mm -hmm. So that for me used to be my life. I mean, I, I wrote probably four to six, seven books a year um, for a while there, which is how I, I got my 30 under 30. <laughs> but it was exhausting. And not all of them are books that I'm the most proud of, honestly. Some of them are very generic for me and they're not as on brand as what I've now cultivated my brand to be. Um, and so for me, like one of the changes in that is I now work with my co-author Aurelia Jane almost exclusively. Um, I, I only do co-authored stuff. I don't do solo stuff anymore because I don't have the bandwidth to actually do it all on my own and to write a book beginning to end on my own anymore. Yeah. So I'm great with admin. I'm fantastic with marketing. I love those things. And I like writing, but I don't like having to write the entire book by myself. Like I wish the book would write itself once I came up with the ideas, but yeah. I think we all kind of wish that. We all definitely. Oh, I think that's do. true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's amazing to be that self-aware. And I guess Heather has to, you know, have a, have played a part in that. But yeah, just I think knowing your your not your weaknesses, but where you can get around 
mm-hmm. what you don't want to do, right? As mm-hmm. you know, working with somebody else is a huge thing, and not everybody yeah. can do it. No, but yeah. yeah, for you, that's worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with working with someone else, you definitely have to find someone that. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. That was my phone alarm. Okay. That's usually yeah. what up my phone. Right. You've got to yes, me. yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> So good. So, when how it comes to you, working, how did you find her? Just out of curiosity, the origin she story. Used to be my editor. Um, so we worked together in that capacity for yes, like twenty true. books, and I was like, I really like working with you. Why don't you write a book with me? And she was like, No. And I was like, Okay, but what if you wrote a book with me? And she was like, No. <laughs> I just continued bothering her until eventually she said, Fine, let's you try it. Down, yeah. basically. You went for the dripping tips thing and just kept that her and at her and at her until she broke down. I like it. Exactly. That's the sort of thing I would do. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is exactly how that went. And then we wrote a book together and it actually went really well. Like we enjoyed the process. Um, we found that we're very compatible and our writing is is very complimentary. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel like two different people are writing it when we write together which is an important thing. Um, so yeah, no, we found that we really love the process and just have continued with it since then. Mm-hmm. Awesome. That's and how clever to have an editor on tap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So she does do a lot of our, our editing. That is because yeah. I also dislike editing. So that's another thing mm-hmm. that when you find someone, don't find someone that has the same exact strengths as you yeah, because right. you're just going to end up doubling down on hating the same exact things and it doesn't <laughs> yeah. really get you anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> she mm. loves editing. So I'm like, have at it. Mm. Enjoy. After yeah. I've written the book, like I don't want to look at it again. The next yeah. time I want to look at it is when it's a physical pretty edition sitting on my yeah. shelf. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. True. I love that too. Yeah. Nice. Mm. Awesome. So, so um, you... And that, so I've been reading all these posts and I'm just trying to make you say the same stuff, but I don't know. Um, so another thing that you mentioned, you were talking about with one of your um, launches or releases somewhere and you sort of said, you know, Heather told me that I should reach out to people and and ask for help more often. And, <laughs> and this is me doing that essentially is what you were saying. So is that something, and it was kind of like this fear of rejection and that's something that I feel too. And I think a lot of authors do that we don't like to reach out. So how did you kind of, have, have you been working on that? Is, is that a work in progress or do you feel like you've kind of, cracked the code I would say that's a a work in progress that fear of rejection um I don't know if you guys are familiar with enneagrams yeah we've had Claire Claire Taylor on so some of you are and some of you are not I have an appointment actually with Claire Taylor I think it's is this week or next week um so I'm an enneagram too which means my basic fear is being unloved or unwanted so that fear of rejection is very very strong for me mm-hmm. and it's something that I've had to work very hard to get past and kind of get to this place of I don't care what anyone thinks mm-hmm. I'm not fully there but I'm like 90 percent there and that mm-hmm. I fully credit Heather on that one because I don't think I would be here on my own Mm -hmm. Um, and it continues to take work. Like, it's not something that you can just, you do it and then you cross the threshold and you're done. Like there's not an end zone Mm -hmm. that you reach and Mm -hmm. voila, Mm -hmm. all of your problems are solved. Like you have to continue working on these things because Mm -hmm. otherwise new things will crop up or your old problems will start to like come back again Mm -hmm. and they'll be like, Oh, hi, you thought we were gone. Hey bitch. (laughs) (laughs) News for you. (laughs) Exactly. So Mm -hmm. That's something that I, I do a lot of reading nonfiction as well now. Mm-hmm. Um, I read Amanda Francis and Denise Duffield. Yeah. Something. I can't yeah. remember. That's it. Duffield Thomas, I think she is. I, I was going to say Thomas, but then I was like, no, maybe that's not it. Maybe it yeah. is though. Yeah, I think um, it is. I think you're right. Yeah. So I've been reading a lot of nonfiction and things that are meant to help improve. And I feel like that really helps me keep my mindset where it needs to be. Mm. Um, it's different for everyone, but in my case, like what I'm reading tends to really impact me mentally, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So I choose to read things that are going to help me mm-hmm. and keep you in the yeah. right mindset. Yeah. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. definitely. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Okay. Do you have any last advice for our listeners? Like if there was someone going, Oh, I need to sort my mindset out. We we're, we're or what's the thing they could be working on first or doing first? Go do Heather's mastermind after you read her book. That's what I say. I feel like I'm like a a broadcasting person for Heather, honestly, because I'm like very much pro her. Um, Renee Rose also has a fantastic book, Right to Market, or Right right to Riches, Right to Riches, not Right to Market. (laughs) And so I read that one, and that one's really good as well. Um, But, you know, 
use these resources that are available in the community mm. and mm. actually choose to work on your own stuff instead of just sitting in it and thinking it's going to get better on its own because it's it's not going to get better on its own. Mm. Like you have to actually address it for yourself to see improvement. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wise words. That's fantastic. And I would mm. also say anyone um, wanting to learn more about special editions, Kickstarter or Facebook ads, pop over to your, no, it's not, Cal Cal the Cal Carpenter website, which is where you sell your books. It's the what is it called? It's called Rule Your Author, Rule your author. Rule your author. Empire. Empire. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I stopped halfway through that word. Yeah, Rule Your Author Empire. Um and and go and have a look and see there um what Cal has to offer. Um mm -hmm. is are there any other places um or you know, okay, any last words, first of all, anything else you'd like to, to uh say to our listeners in general about writing, publishing golden nugget to end the show with from your perspective wish i had a golden nugget i should have figured that out before getting on here thank you for <laughs> letting me ramble this long um i greatly appreciate it and i oh, hope that's yeah. helpful oh it hasn't been a ramble about. trust me no we, i've got like pages of notes pages pages of notes yeah it's been amazing oh, that's cool it's been Trudy and i came back from ram so we're all like oh what oh, what <laughs> Yeah. fantastic you want a gold nugget go to ram like that's another yeah. one yeah, yeah i agree yeah, Learn from, do you know what i feel the golden nugget from you is is maybe mindset for example is not something you can do on your own and maybe you need the help of others if it's a coach or maybe friends or or mm -hmm. those kinds of things like to discuss it and talk about it and kind of bring it, it all into yourself. the open yeah you can't do it yourself and, and asking for help yeah. and looking around for help is is mm -hmm. definitely the way forward there yeah so Perfect. do Lots that so mm -hmm. you know working on mm -hmm. that and getting to a place where you feel comfortable with someone that you mm -hmm. can trust to actually talk about these things I think mm -hmm. that's a really good way to way to be yeah, yeah. definitely no, definitely sure. well thank awesome. you so much for, for joining us for on the show today Cal. Cal it's it's awesome. been fantastic we've really enjoyed it um so we know where to find Cal oh yeah. well, is there anywhere else that you where do, where do you hang out most what's the one place people should go um, find you I'm in Facebook Messenger and on Instagram a lot. So either one of those, mm -hmm. I'm, oh, and in my email. You email me, I will email back. It might take me a day, but I will email back. So if you have questions or follow-up things, feel mm -hmm. free to just reach out and I'm happy to answer. Very Fantastic. Okay. That's awesome. Well, and make we sure can... all of Cal's links are in the show notes. And mm -hmm. um, so you need to come along to spygirlspodcast.com to glean all the information there, also on your podcast app, they should be in there as well um and coincidentally we have interviewed pretty much everybody that cal has talked about today as well so we'll make sure those links are in too because you know mm -hmm. we love yep. learning as well mm -hmm. and um yes that's spygirlspodcast.com i am three and i say i that this is my big beef to get us up to three thousand on youtube oh, we're three gosh, people away we we're on 2997 <laughs> subscribers so if you could just tip us over the edge. It will just save a lot of angst on my behalf. And yeah. also, oh, she just keeps cutting <laughs> so on nags. about, you know, like, she, she talk, yeah. I know, it'll stop me nagging until, until we get to yeah. 4,000. That's it. So that's it. Spar Girls Podcast yes. on awesome. YouTube. Okay. All righty. Okay, yeah, well, thank you all for listening to another episode of the Spar Girls Podcast. Um, we'll be back again next week. But for now, farewell. Well, bye. 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 bye.